additionally, we want to give you guys a chance to interact with us. So, I'll be showing you guys how uh, we'll be releasing some questions related to web development, and you guys can interact with us through social media and stuff like that, but more details on that later. Then, guys, we'll get into the meat of web development itself. So, the first thing we're going to do is talk about what web development actually is, because some of you guys, most of you guys will likely know what it is you've gotten yourself in for for the next four weeks, but some of you guys might not be exactly sure what is involved with web development. So I'm going to briefly cover, guys, uh, what is involved in that. Then, guys, we're going to have a look at all the individual components of a web application, which is what we want to be able to build at the end of this four weeks. We'll also talk about the different kinds of content that are available on the Internet. So uh, web developers generally focus on web applications, but you can also get static websites and other kinds of content available uh, on the Internet. And I'll be discussing the different kinds of content that are available. Finally, guys, we'll finish the class with an introduction to HTML and CSS. As web developers, uh, we'll need to know how HTML and CSS work so that we can interact with it, and we can also interact with web designers who are mostly in charge with the front end. Uh, so I'll be giving you guys a brief overview of what's involved, and then in lesson two we'll be going into more detail about HTML and CSS, and we'll build our very first static web page in that class as well. Okay guys, the first things first, I want to talk about the value of a website. And before we do that, I kind of want to talk about actual websites, because some of you guys may not know what a website is. A website, guys, it is a location, a sort of a metaphorical location on a server, which is connected to the internet, and it contains one or more web pages. Now, what I mean by this, guys, is that a single web page is a single file on a computer, and a website is a logical grouping of those web pages. Finally, it's on a server, which is connected to the network that is the internet, and by doing that, it means that this particular website is accessible to anyone who's on the internet. All right, so guys, you might have heard that we've got, you know, newspapers and shops, uh, books that you can read. Now, this is something that used to be the only way to communicate products, information, ideas, up-to-date information, uh, textbooks if you want to learn, and all of that exciting and fun and interesting stuff. However, guys, that is no longer the case because uh, we've now got the advent of the digital age and the internet. So... All of these things, information and knowledge, products and services, and entertainment, or, to put it simply, trade of any kind, trade of information, trade of products, trade of services. All of this, guys, it used to be done in a traditional way in a real-world place. But now, with the advent of the Internet, we can go to a place on the Internet from the comfort of your own home. Just to put this into a little bit of perspective, can you guys tell me, what Amazon does, what is the service that Amazon provides on the Internet? It's not an actual place, it's a website on the Internet. But what does Amazon do for its website visitors? I'm just going to wait for a couple of seconds because I know that there is a stream delay of about three or four seconds. There we go, we've got retail, online store, delivery, trade, robs me of my money from Jim. Uh, we've got sales products, big store, sales books, online platform for buying different products. Uh, subscription services, very good. It actually does a lot of things, but yes, guys, the general consensus is that it's a retail online store. We've also got the New York Times, and what do you guys think about the New York Times? What does that do as a service? Uh, the New York Times, of course, is a website that you can access as well, apart from being a newspaper. There you go, provides news. Uh, information, news, paper, shares news. So it's up to date, it's information that it's giving us online. Of course, we have Google. Now, this is a slightly more difficult one, guys. What does Google do for its users? Instead, of Amazon provides a product, that's standard. The New York Times provides information, that's standard. What about Google, guys? It's a search engine, that's absolutely correct. We've got sales database, that is also correct. More on that later. Uh, we've got search engine, SEO, indexing of the web. That's a great answer. Uh, very good. Collect data, too. So, guys, yes, to summarize what you're saying, it's a search engine. And it's a search engine that works because it's actually categorized all the web pages that it can find on the Internet. And that's the service it provides. It organizes the Internet for its users. And it gets paid 
very well to do so. Just a quick sort of uh, primer for our lesson on revenue. Google's users are worth 12 euro per user to anyone who's willing to buy that information. That's how much money information is worth to another tech company. Then, of course, we've got companies like YouTube and Shaw Academy. Of course, YouTube provides video content and Shaw Academy provides education. So there's really no limit to the kind of services or products that a website or a web application, as we'll be seeing in a moment, actually can provide. So Google is everything. Education from Hanselseed, yes, absolutely, guys. Education, online learning is the newest and the greatest form of learning because it's information accessible from the comfort of your own home. What is web development? Well, web development, it refers to building, creating, and maintaining web content online. Uh, and it also includes uh, web design, web publishing, web programming, and database management. Literally everything to do with uh, online website building is part of the web development full stack. So for some of you guys who may be asking, why is it that I should be learning web development? Maybe I should be doing web design instead. Maybe I should, I should be doing graphic design, this and that. Uh, even if it's uh, related to web uh, website building, well, web development, guys, it covers it all. So what I'm going to do now is give you a quick comparison of a few things inside web development, and then I'll finish off with a summary of uh, web development itself. So first thing I want to do, guys, is compare the difference between a web page or a website. Obviously, you guys have all surfed the internet before, or else I guess you would not have found uh, Shaw Academy and gotten yourself signed up for this course. But guys, uh, websites aren't just a website, they're divided into what's known as a web page. A web page is a document that is written in HTML. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it is a way of describing content. So a web page simply is a document that is written in this language in such a way that a browser and search engines are able to understand them. A website, on the other hand, is a collection of web pages, and as a result, it is a collection of HTML pages. So, uh, web pages and websites, guys, they're all accessible through the internet using a web browser. It doesn't matter if you're using Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox or even an Internet Explorer. All of these web pages that you're building are accessible from any browser, any modern browser at least. Uh, some of you guys are here because you want to be web designers. Some of you guys are here because you want to be web developers. Well, I would like to clarify the difference between the two. First things first, web design and web development, they all are under the umbrella of web development, the full stack. However, there is a difference between the role of a web designer as a job and the role of a web developer as a job. So let me just go through exactly what these differences and similarities are. Are now. So a web developer guy, a web designer rather, is in charge of the look and feel of a website. So this includes everything from the colors that are on a web page to the fonts to the way the web page is laid out to the navigation of your website to all the menus. Uh, things like how many pages it should have, how to make the site easy to navigate, and so on. Uh, they generally have a design background, so they use the design and the structure-based coding languages such as HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript in order to add interactivity. A web developer, on the other hand, is going to have a broader range of IT skills. So web developers, they generally go beyond just the presentation of web content. They're more responsible for adding functionality and infrastructure to a website. So they basically make sure that the website does what it's supposed to do. To put it simply, a web designer is the person who deal, deals with the visual design and layout, where, whereas the web developer, he takes that design and vision from a static design to a fully working website that's online and available to the world. Uh, web developers are usually more programming focused and will also do things like creating databases, setting up web servers, and of course, sorting out hosting for web content. For me, it's actually really great because I am a web developer, and it also means that I can generally jump into any part of web content creation with relative ease. 
Uh, so, uh, to put it in real-world uh, relative terms, a web designer is kind of like an architect if you're building a building, whereas a web developer is like an engineer. So, web, desi- web architects sort of uh, design and make something look good, whereas the web developer turns that dream into a reality. Final comparison that I'd like to make, guys, is the difference between a website and a web application, because I've already mentioned these two terms, but I'd like to clarify exactly what the differences are. So, a website is uh, mostly static, and what I mean by this is that content rarely changes. In many cases, uh, websites are basically used just for information uh, or brochure-style content, and this content is generally the same for every single person that visits the website. Uh, Some of the simple examples of this would include the IMDb and the New York Times websites. Uh, A web application, on the other hand, is dynamic, and this means that the content is frequently changing. It's dependent on user interaction and will change based on what the users do inside that application. So this means the content is dynamically generated on a user-by-user basis. A great example of a web application would be Facebook. Uh, So, for example, Facebook, uh, when you log into Facebook, you see a completely personalized newsfeed of posts from your friends. Uh, You can make a post, and what you see on your page will change immediately. And your post will also change what your friends see on their newsfeed. This makes Facebook a truly dynamic and user-dependent web application, because uh, without the users interacting with each other, Facebook would serve no purpose. If there were no users on Facebook... There is no content, and without content, it would just be an empty web application. And nobody would want to visit a site like that. Uh, For similar reasons, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, these are all web apps as well. Uh, Without users to add content and interact with each other, they would serve no meaningful purpose. I would like to mention, guys, that at this point in recent years, uh, the line between a website and a web application is becoming a little bit blurry because most websites now have some web application element, uh, whereas before a website would only have contained static information. Um, it might now have uh, an online f- store or a, a booking system for tours. Uh, going back to the IMDB example, uh, while it contains mostly static information, it does have functionality to provide extra information to its pro users. Uh, this course, of course, will be focusing on how to build a web application. Why should you wor- learn web development? I, a- I asked you guys this uh, at the beginning of the class, and the answer, guys, I'm waiting to see. Would you guys like to tell me what it is you think is the reason for people to want to learn web development? What purpose would it serve to be a web developer? Yes, so guys, uh, just to summarize essentially what you guys were saying, the internet is absolutely everywhere, and it is only growing. It's becoming more and more popular as time goes on. As a result of that, there are more and more companies out there looking for people who are web developers. And as a result, that means that there are more jobs available in this industry. Uh, As an added benefit of being a web developer as a profession, or even as a freelancer, even for fun, is that you can web development from literally anywhere. As long as you have an internet connection to test out your website, well, you can develop web applications. And uh, in a lot of places in the world these days, you can have access to the internet. The final point is someone was just saying out of interest so that you can build a website. And yes, that's absolutely correct, guys. If you are a web developer, you can create just about anything that you can imagine. So there are a lot of very good reasons, guys, to become a web developer or even just to learn web development. All right, so we're on to our next section now. We're going to talk about the components of a web application. I've talked about web development And now I'd like to talk about web applications, which is what we are going to be building in this course. Uh, So, the components of web application, guys, these are the little modules, separate modules that can be worked on by separate people, if you'd like, and they can join together to make up the whole, namely a web application. Uh, The components include things like the web server, uh, the web pages that would be built by a web designer, the back-end code that would be designed by a web programmer, and the databases that would be created by an SQL developer. So all of these different modules, guys, they join up together and they finally are able to create a fully working web application. Before we get started on this section, guys, I'd like to ask you a question. What elements of a web application are contained inside a web server? So do bear this question in mind as I go through this section. Hopefully, at the end of this section, you'll know the answer to this question. Okay. 
So, uh, guys, uh, we talked about what web development is. We talked about the different kinds of content that we can create. So now I want to have a look at the component parts of web applications. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot in this section, guys, so keep in mind it's just an overview, and these topics will be introduced individually in their own lessons. So, there are many different components that a web app consists of. These can be divided into four main categories. So, the first category is the web server software. So, these are the systems that run web applications. Uh, namely, Apache. We will be using Apache once it gets to that point in this course. However, guys, you don't need to worry too much about Apache other than where it sits in the full stack. We'll be going over that uh, later on in the course as well. So the server essentially, guys, it receives requests from a user and it also sends the data back to the user that requested it. It's the one in charge of the networking side of things, essentially. The next main component of a web application, guys, is the web pages themselves. And as discussed, web pages are made up of HTML, CSS, and a little bit of JavaScript. HTML is the content, CSS is the layout uh, and design of that content, and JavaScript is what can add dynamic functionality. So if you were to open a menu, for example, well, the JavaScript is in charge of opening that menu, uh, the CSS is in charge of how the menu looks, and the HTML is in charge of the actual contents of that menu. So that's how the three work together to create a good-looking web application. So another component of a web application, guys, is the back-end code. So the back-end code is kind of like the thinking, the brain of a web application. So what it does is it can dynamically generate HTML. It can converse with the databases, which we'll be talking about in a moment, in order to generate that content, in order to allow users to log in. It has to find out and calculate. Uh, it does all of the thinking on the back-end side. We will be using PHP in this course. However, you can ju use just about any software programming language you can think of. Someone was asking, can you use C++? Well, yes, you can use C++ instead of PHP if you like. But we use PHP in this course because it's very nice and easy to get set up with this language. It's relatively easy to learn, and it has all of the useful functionality that we're going to need. So the last main component of a web application, guys, is the database itself. So the database is like the memory. If you can think of a web application as a human, the database is like the, the memory, the remembering of information. Uh, for all, almost every web application, for a lot of software programs as well, databases are the way this information is stored. Databases store information in an organized manner, which means that we can access, manipulate, and change that data very easily. Uh, in this course, we will be using the database software known as MariaDB, but uh, you don't need to worry too much about the specific software because we will be interacting with our software using a user interface known as phpMyAdmin, which will make our life a little bit easier in terms of setting up our databases. Okay, so I'm going to have a look in a little bit more depth at each of these components. So let's start things off by looking at the web server itself. A web server, guys, in actuality, is simply a computer that has installed software to deliver web pages. Uh, it also contains the contents of a website, so all of that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is actually just stored as a file on that computer. And then, guys, when, of course, a user requests that information, it gets sent to that person's computer. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Sorry, guys. Uh, all right. So believe it or not, guys, you're already using a web server every day. Every time you type in the URL of a website, so if you typed in www.google.com, for example, the Internet will send a request to the web server that has that content. That web server will then find that information on its hard drives, and it will send it back through the Internet to your web browser. Uh, we're going to have a look at an example now to better understand that. So here we can see, guys, that a person has entered in the URL for Facebook.com on their computer. What happens then is that the request for that website is actually sent to the appropriate web server, the web server that is linked to the URL www.facebook.com, and in this case, it would be the web server that's located at the Facebook data center. 
At this point, the database, will, uh, the web server will actually have a conversation with its hard drives. It will do all of the processing that it needs to do using its backend coding language, and then it will send the results back to the web browser that requested that information. I'm sure you can imagine, though, that Facebook receives a lot more than requests from one user at any given moment. In fact, it's more like hundreds or thousands per second. Uh, obviously, you need a pretty extreme uh, computer in order to deal with all these requests, and this is where what's known as a data center comes in. A data center is a network of web servers, and these are all linked together, and they're specifically designed to handle a large amount of data requests. These data centers can often include hundreds, if not thousands, of web servers, all processing millions and millions of requests per hour. Uh, High-end web servers, guys, they generally use special components that are designed to run 24-7. If you try to make your own personal computer that you're watching this uh, webinar on, for example, do that task. Uh, even if the requests are lower, you would find that very, very quickly your computer would run into problems. And this is why having high-quality web servers is really, really important. Uh, we'll be discussing this, though, in more depth in Lesson 4. Okay, so the next component that I will have a little bit of a, a deeper look at is uh, HTML5. Uh, so, uh, we know from earlier that a web page is a document written in HTML. But what is HTML? Well, HTML is a markup language. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And the current version, guys, is HTML5. So since we are working uh, with, you know, today's date, uh, 17th of October, we're just simply going to learn the latest version of HTML just because it's a lot better, it has more functionality, and it allows us to be more efficient in our design. Uh, okay, so HTML uses small pieces of code called tags in order to differentiate itself from the text inside a web page. Tags also tell the web browser how content should be formatted. For example, whether something is supposed to be part of a paragraph, or if it's the title of the web page, or if it's supposed to be an image. Uh, tags are constructed using the name of the tag surrounded by angled brackets. You can see here that I have the letters HTML inside two angled brackets, and this constitutes a HTML tag. There are loads and loads of HTML tags, guys, that help us mark up pages more easily. I will be looking at some of the basic ones in the next lesson. HTML, guys, it's constantly being updated to make it better. The current version, as I said, is HTML5, but HTML6 is actually coming out in the next year or so. So uh, HTML will change in the next couple of years. So the next thing I want to talk about is CSS. Uh, Text-based web pages, they're all brilliant, and that's how you can design a web page just using HTML. But to be honest, guys, if you want people to stay on your web page in the modern day, it has to look good. And this is where CSS comes in. CSS, <coughs> excuse me, guys, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It's the coding language that's used to style, to position, and to lay out web page content. This includes everything from colors to fonts to spacing and everything to do with how a web page looks. And uh, without CSS, web pages would look just like text documents, and we'll be looking at an example of this later on. Uh, the latest version, guys, is CSS3. Um, there's currently no plans for CSS4 as far as I'm aware in the near future, but I will let you know if that changes. Okay, before we move on to backend code, which is the final component of a web application that I want to look at, uh, uh, we want to have a look at some of the terminology. One of the students earlier on mentioned front end, and front end is a term that means everything that is sent to the client's browser. So this includes HTML, it includes CSS, and it also includes JavaScript. Uh, on the other hand, guys, we've got the back end, and the back end is everything that refers and happens to on a web server, and you will never see it if you are a user. So this is generally data processing, database interactions. I will be looking at why splitting up this front and back end is very important later on in the course. But for now, I just want everyone to have a general understanding of these terms. Uh, both of these things, guys, put together, this is the full stack of web development, and it is what we aim to have a knowledge of by the end of this four weeks. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about back-end code. Back-end code, it's the brain of a web application. It can essentially be thought of as what makes a website or web application actually work. Uh, it's used to interact with the web server and to perform certain tasks. Uh, back-end code can be used to validate data, it can 
be used to process data and it can manipulate data coming and going from the web server and coming and going from a database. This data could be anything such as a request for a web page, uh, a verifying a password, or logging in using an email address. Uh, to use emails uh, themselves, sending emails, if you send an email, the content of that email goes to a web server somewhere. It's then processed by code, backend code, on that web server, which will find out who sent it, who it's going to, whether there are any files inside the email, and then it will send it to its destination. The software necessary to run backend coding languages is generally pre-installed on most web servers by hosting companies. So we'll be talking about hosting companies, guys, at a later date. Okay, so just have a quick look, guys, at how backend code works. So if we have a user trying to log into a website, let's say his password is terribly unsafe and it is 12345. This 12345 password gets sent to a web server. At this point, guys, the code, the backend code on the web server will check the list of users and passwords on a database to find a match. And if that password is correct, well, then the user gets to log in. It will be an approved password and they'll get access to the website. Or if it's wrong, well, they'll be told that the password is wrong. Very important to note, guys, that this is... Uh, the key difference, guys, is that they never know uh, what the correct password is, that the correct password is never sent to their computer. So as a result, we get the answer to why uh, backend code is so, so important. Uh, the two, there are two very important reasons, but the first is safety, which is what this password verification on the server side does. Because PHP or another backend language exists on the server side, at no point at all does the user have access to the correct password. That never gets shown. What simply happens is that the user sends in his login details and then the verification is sent and all they find out is if the password is wrong or if the password is correct. There's actually another benefit as well to backend code, another very big benefit, and that is that it's much faster. Because servers are designed to do a lot of calculations very quickly, and a, a given user's computer may be very slow, it may be very fast itself, it doesn't matter. All of the calculations can be done on a very fast server computer, and this means that the user on, uh, on any given website will get their information as quickly as possible without having to do any potentially slow operations. The final component, guys, of a web application that I'd like to talk about is databases. So, as I said, uh, they're hidden uh, behind all of the tools and services that you use every day. It's not just for websites, guys. Uh, your phone's, uh, your phone's uh, address book is built using a database. It's actually everywhere. So, in any situation where we require organized information, you're very likely to find a database of some, some description hidden inside the code. Uh, what's important about databases, again, guys, is that it's a collection of information that is organized. Databases are specifically designed to be able to be accessed, manipulated, and searched, most importantly, extremely quickly. So even if you have a database which has 10,000 things inside it, well, your database software will be able to find that one thing inside the database very quickly. That's what they're supposed to do, and that's why they exist. Additionally, databases are very easy to access, to manage, and to update, assuming, of course, that you have the rights to access the database. Uh, databases are also very secure. They're designed so that they shouldn't be accessed by anyone other than the person that's supposed to. The question, though, is, even though all of these things exist, why exactly do we need one? Uh, well, it makes sense uh, as web developers to have all of the data on a server and then only send the user the information that they need. If you had to download everything on a website simply to access that one tiny piece of information that you actually need, well, it seems like a very wasteful use of the network, especially if you have 10,000 users all trying to download your entire web application. So as a result, if we use a database, we can simply organize that information and simply send the information that they require. Uh, to get YouTube as an example, if you open up a YouTube video, you're not loading up the entirety of everything that YouTube owns. You're simply loading up that single video uh, whose access reference location is stored on a database, which means 
that you don't have to download everything to access that 10 minutes or that 5 minute song that you want to listen to. Okay guys, so all of those components guys, they fit together to make up the full stack. Just to give you guys a visual example of what the full stack actually looks like, uh, we're going to take a look at everything together. So here we can see our web server, and as we now know, our web server contains everything we need to run our web content. So we have our server software, which allows the server to accept requests, and we have the web pages, which is what the user of a website will actually see. We'll see the backend code, which controls all of the data processing. And then finally, we have the database, which can be used to store all kinds of data. And then, of course, we have, at the end of the day, the server software will simply send HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The basic web pages get manipulated by the backend code based on database information, and all the user gets at the end of the day is a simple static document. So, uh, going back to our question, what elements of a web application are contained inside a web server? I'm going to have a look at the questions box, guys, for a few minutes to uh, see what you guys think. What, what elements, guys, of a web application are contained inside a web server? So, we've got a bunch of answers got coming in. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got PHP, we've got all, we've got database, we've got backend code and programming database, CSS, HTML, D8 databases, and PHP. We've got PHP and HTML, we've got images, server software, backend code and pages, all of them uh, from Scott and Michael. We've got PHP, everything from Bob, all of it, front end, content, uh, very good answers, guys. Uh, well, to give you guys a brief summary of what was just said there by all of you guys, we've got the server, oops, one second, I've got to click back into my presentation. We've got the server software, we've got the web pages, we've got the backend code, and we've got the database engine, everything is contained in a web application. So, everything to do with a web application, it is stored on a web server. So, if you ever want to build a website, guys, you're going to need a web server in order to store that data. Okay, so we're going to move on now to our final section of the class. This will be a short section, guys. I just want to introduce you to these two uh, programming languages that we're going to be using in the next class. Uh, again, to give a brief definition of these two, HTML is a standardized system for tagging text files to allow font color, graphic, and hyperlink effects on worldwide pages. Just to clarify, guys, HTML itself doesn't actually do the fonting, the coloring, the graphicking, and the hyperlinking on the web page. That's the, well, actually, it does do the hyperlinking, but it doesn't do any of the others. That's the job of CSS. HTML simply marks up the content in a way that the content can have its font, color, graphics, and so on changed. The cascading style sheets, on the other hand, they describe how the HTML elements are to be displayed. So they then get that HTML element, which is organized, because HTML has organized it, and then it's able to manipulate every single element inside a document individually, if that's what you'd like to do. Okay, before we start on the session, guys, just want to ask you, uh, this question, which you should be able to answer by the end of the class. What's the difference between a HTML element and a HTML tag? So these are two terms that you're going to need to know if you're going to be a web developer. So hopefully you'll know the answer to these questions by the end of this section. Right, so talking about HTML and marking up documents. This is what a basic HTML document looks like. You'll notice that it contains multiple tags in particular we'll be looking at the title, the H1, and the P tags. And all of these tags have contents, so I am a title, I am a heading, and I am a paragraph, are the inner HTML of the HTML element, whereas the title, and then on the other side, we have our closing title, for example. Uh, these are the opening and the closing tags of that HTML element. Uh, you can see, guys, that the closing tag is preceded by a forward slash symbol. And this is how you can let uh, a browser that's interpreting your page know that that's the end of that particular tag. The reason for this, guys, uh, we need to tell the browser where the tag ends. Okay, so uh, you can see, guys, in this I am a paragraph example, we've got I am a paragraph, which starts with an opening P tag, which is opening angles bracket, 
letter P, and then closing angled bracket. And then it ends with a closing P tag, which is an opening angled bracket, a forward slash, and then the letter P and the closing angled bracket. Everything inside of those two tags will be formatted as a paragraph. I also have the text. I have a heading inside the head one tag, and the hedge one tag is a large heading tag, so that everything inside of it will be formatted as a heading. So let's see what happens when we run this page inside a browser. You can see that the text inside the title tag is rendered in the tab at the top, and then the text inside the H1 tag renders as a large heading, and the text inside the P tag renders as some normal paragraph tag, uh, text. This is the main principle of HTML, guys. It allows the developer to separate web page content in a way that the web browser can understand. A quick note, though, guys. I said that CSS is in charge of the formatting of a document, whereas the, H, uh, whereas the HTML is simply in charge of marking it up. But the results in the browser show differently. You'll see that the H1 and the P, they look different because the heading 1 looks larger, it looks bolder, uh, and uh, it looks like a heading, whereas the paragraph looks like a paragraph. The reason for this, guys, is that HTML originally was supposed to also be in charge of marking up text. However, this was taken over by CSS, so HTML simply still has some remnants of formatting documents. However, you should never be using HTML elements in order to format a document. You simply should be using HTML elements to make a document comprehensible, at which point you use CSS to overwrite the default, um, the default uh, uh, formatting for any given piece of text. So well, let's take this same browser guy, uh, this same uh, HTML document, and what we're going to do now is see what this would look like if I simply added a blue background and a white text to my paragraph using some CSS code. And as you can see, I applied CSS to the browser document, and all that's happened is that the text in the paragraph is now white and the background is blue. This is clearly a very simple example, but it should give you an idea of how CSS functions to style pages. All right, guys, so I asked you at the beginning of this section, what is the difference between a HTML element and a HTML tag? So let's have a look and see what you guys are thinking now. Uh, HTML is the cosmetic surgery law from Luke. Yeah, that's basically it. CSS is the covering, the, the, the external side of things. Um, let's see. Uh, any answers, guys, to this question? I'm waiting for you guys to answer what the difference is. If you can define an element and a tag, that would absolutely work. Elements is done by CSS. Not quite Susanna, but a good attempt. Elements from opening tag to closing tag from George. That's very good. HTML element is the basics of the HTML code. The tag element is the body tag. That's close as well. HTML is affected by the tag. That's true. HTML tag is the blue text in brackets. Uh, that is correct, yes. HTML element is the whole thing from Sam. That's absolutely correct. All right, so guys, uh, thank you very much for your answers. The element, guys, is the full markup of a section. So it includes the tags, it includes the inner HTML, and it also includes the closing tag. All of that together is a single HTML element. A tag, on the other hand, is simply the little opening brackets, uh, so, uh, the tag itself and the closing brackets. It's simply something to define what kind of element we're making. So, uh, all right. Uh, very good stuff, guys. Uh, we're going to finish off the class now. We're going to do our summary. So we covered what web development is in general. We then covered the different components of a web application. We looked at the four main components of a web application and had a very brief overview of each of these sections. We will be going into every single component I've discussed in a lot more detail, guys, in the next four weeks. Uh, but of course, at the end of our class, we had a brief introduction to HTML and CSS and saw exactly what uh, was actually involved in building a static website. So congrats, guys. You've done your first lesson. You've laid the foundation. This is an Irish phrase that I actually can't pronounce, but it's an Irish proverb meaning a good start is half the battle. So now, guys, we have the basics. We can actually start to build on our theoretical and technical knowledge to improve our knowledge of each component of the full stack. And eventually, you guys will be able to say that you are a web developer. Don't forget to attend all the lessons live, guys, so that you can ask questions and you can benefit as much as